Welcome. This is the January 31st Open ZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Rod, Stu, Greg, Daniel, Jan, myself, Michael, and the BSD CAN call for participation closes February 12th. That is an amazing event. I have seen Matt Ahrens there and company. So there, it's a, there are often uh, lunchtime boffs hosted by Alan Jude. So if you're looking for overlap and you happen to be due south of Ottawa, looking at you, Andrew, uh, do try to get that on your radar. We are looking for presentations. We are looking for attendees and sponsorships. And along similar lines, I would love to poll all of you about the 2024 Ozdok, which would be the OpenZFS Developer and Production User Conference. At this uh, last October's event in downtown San Francisco, as per tradition, uh, Matt and company said, hey, Michael, you seem like the uh, most social, least developery of us. Uh, what are your thoughts on events? And we just started brainstorming about things like tacking the a an open ZFS event, which has traditionally been focused on developers, but could easily include users, either tacking it on, say, BSD can, like I've done with BeehiveCon, or tack it on to, obviously, the American Latvian Association Annual Congress. And I've just returned from a fancy hotel downtown Portland, where it was just about everything perfect, but it's also at a premium price. And I do have a community center that Rodney has seen that could host a one or two track event and just be a lot more laid back, but without a hotel nearby. So I know that what? Three of us are in the general neighborhood in Portland, so we're going to be completely biased, but I'd love to hear from, say, the Daniels and Andrews and Jans of the world who would be traveling a lot farther. And Greg, I think you're in Canada. So thoughts, please. Any wish list items? And have any of you been to a an OpenZFS developer summit? I have not. What would be most attractive to get you there? Uh, the content, the people, the the hallway track, the price, you name it. I have no idea. Have honestly. you attended many events? Um, <laughs> I've attended some stuff for in the um, um, VMware space before. Okay, fair enough. Um. Have fun, keep records. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Stu, are you a conference goer? Do you have some favorites? You a Vegas guy? Uh, well, our our main one is NAB. So you gonna be there this year or next month or whenever? We'll have a we'll have a booth. So um so I'll be a booth babe. Oh, you will. Okay. <laughs> um yeah. Kind of shifting around a little bit due to uh, some of our partners are having strange issues, but you know, all that's fun. But if you're looking for red cameras, they'll be at our booth. Okay, nice. In AB. Uh, oh, it, it, oh, thank you. It map probably like kid. Yeah, I last year I thought, hey, it's cheap as just to fly in at like seven in the morning and fly out in the evening. It worked out just fine. Yeah, no hotel. Um, welcome, Alexander. Welcome, welcome. So uh, other than open DFS remotely, which up until last year, which Michael, you and I've talked about before, mm -hmm. really, really good and interactive. Um, for the remote people last year, it was not so much. Yeah, it was uh, engineers in charge of AV, and they're really good at engineering and to some degree emceeing, and then AV was kind of last. <laughs> so <laughs> points taken there. And then nothing on ha the hackathon was remote. not a thing. Correct. Uh, the um, obviously that was feedback that provided right after the show. But um, I honestly prefer remote. Uh, okay. Because of the number of things on my plate and yep. what's inter you know I can let's focus directly on what's interesting and do some work on the side on stuff that isn't or directly applicable to me. Uh, but I do focus of conferences. I've done probably a dozen over the years. Um, okay. Big vendors, you know, 
but you know, one was Veritas World. You know, that nice. Nice. Um, don't, don't date yourself. But yeah, uh, yeah. is there a conference that gets the remote aspect right and ideal? The, the IATF immersive? has done fairly well with that. But okay. They've been doing remote participation in their conferences. Uh, I'm going to say probably going on 20 years. And they, the COVID, the two plus years of COVID not being able to have in-person conferences let them learn a whole lot about how to do a remote participation conference where everybody was remote. Mm -hmm. and realize typically we're 1,400 people. So wow. it's, it's a, a non-trivial thing to do remote. But they got it reasonably correct, I take it. Yeah, they got yeah, it remote nice. worked fairly well. Um, I mean the first couple ones were a little bit rough, but um got it. So uh Alexander and Antrenig, uh I have just brought up for the first time the topic of a possible 2024 open ZFS developer and production user conference or simply user. Matt would like to see that happen, and he really would not to like to be very hands-on with it. I will talk to Karen on Friday, who's been behind the scenes on all of the events, and she's been great. And I've just returned from a fancy hotel for a conference I will have no choice in hosting in October, which is coincidentally when the OpenZFS developer event typically was in the past. So um, I absolutely welcome your feedback, Alexander and Antrenig, so because we, I'm trying to get the geographic spread here because we have at least three of us in the Portland area, which kind of skews it. Go ahead. Uh, even, even Daniel, I mean, do you find yourself crossing the country for events like this? I can't think of a reason not to. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so... Yeah, hallway for sure is the yeah. you know, social events in hallway is the number one reason why I would go to to anything on either coast. Um, so I guess I'm running out of excuses not to go to BSD Can, huh? Gotcha. Um, <laughs> yeah, I better work on that. Um, yeah. So what what month were you looking at this for? October. It's traditionally been October, and that's quite good insofar as it's really late in like wedding season and not yet holiday season. So venues are a little more flexible. Right. And uh, the event I just looked at like an hour ago was for October 10th and 13th. And because Open ZFS is often Monday, Tuesday, I was like, well, I could kind of segue and maybe get some discounts on a pretty fancy venue. Or we have a funky community center, semi-funky community center in Southwest Portland, but no nearby hotels. So there's also the option of classic downtown San Francisco, which has its perks and drawbacks. And then uh, possibly there's an idea of tacking it on to BSD can as I did with BeehiveCon once. So it's all up in the air, it's all fair game, but the easier we can make this for everyone, the better. And if you want to volunteer to help, <laughs> you've come to the right place. <clears throat> well, I'm always attending OpenZFS conferences for the last years, and mm -hmm. sure, I don't see a problem to travel to San Francisco or if some other areas that would be okay too. Uh, it's just in San Francisco, obviously, it's not exactly great last time. So, last couple of times, I stayed out and drove to the center. But there oh. or other place. <clears throat> Yeah, and the, another bit of feedback on last time was that there wasn't super great remote participation, especially on the second day for which there was, well, zero. So, understood. Um, Entrenig, do you think uh, you'd make it far, far away if you had a budget? I mean, or do you need, would you rely heavily on, say, online participation and might want to help make that happen? Which date is this? Uh, roughly middle of October. Just say hypothetically October fifteenth, plus or minus, to Europe, uh, in possibly Portland, Oregon, where three possibly of the Portland. attendees are of this call. Uh, um, I'll count Vancouver as part. 
I can't promise because that mostly relies on the American embassy, but uh, I can try. I, I have no reason why not. Interesting. We'd love to have you. Um, anyhow, please just throw your ideas out in whatever form you want them to take and to revisit the previous brief topic. Uh, the BSD can call for participation is open. We're looking for attendees, speakers, and sponsors. So hopefully that can be you. Uh, I'll just put you down for like, we'd love to. Um, All right. Right Are they short on talks for BST CAN? Uh, that will be clear in the last 12 hours because the majority of, uh, of, of participants are last minute. So I'm not worried at all, but you never know. And of course, I'll extend it if it's a problem and get noisy about it. So uh, February is technically a bit early just to kind of give everyone some leg room to either uh, extend it or to uh, call it good. And I did talk to Patrick yesterday. Uh, we, we could accommodate remote, preferably in the afternoon and after lunch when we can really futz with things, but uh, it's not our preferred strategy simply because it's, you know, it's not like a remote first event like IETF was at one point during COVID. Anywho, there's some food for thought. I welcome any and all participation, ideas, suggestions, offers to help. Uh, but with the holidays out of the way and the, the threshold of the new year, I'm I'm now getting involved with that. So you heard it here first. Other topics. I know, uh, Daniel and Rod, you've been chatting about Zelta. I've been using it virtually every day. It sounds like we are up to four or five users. Maybe that's a really low estimate. Uh, I will let, actually, uh, did we lose Stu? No, Stu, uh, have you been using Zelta? Do you have any points or questions? Um, I have been using it. I'm actually building out a um, performance test environment right now for some other platforms. So it's going to get beaten up next weekend or next Excellent. week. So there was one other testing that we Ooh. talked about, I want to say three or four weeks ago. Was it lots of V devs or something? Um, sorry, off topic from Zelta, but. Yeah, uh, we can get to that. And if, if you have nothing else on Zelta, actually, I'm going to jump right in there and say, hey, I broke my own rule. Developers always get the stage first. So, uh, Alexander, if you have any topics or questions or news, we'd love to hear from you. I can't say they have much. Uh, just yesterday was a developer monthly developer call, and uh, I asked Brian what's the plan for 2.3 and promised it's branches, branching about end of June uh, so that... Uh, I needed that from perspective of knowing timeline for using it in TrueNAS. Mm -hmm. uh, so previously we were discussed that there's just not enough uh, ZFS master testing. So if we would know when exactly 2.3 is going to be branched, we may use master more actively in TrueNAS uh, and so get some early testers, early adapters. So uh, previous 2.2 was branched at end of June. So we agreed that it should be reasonable to expect branching branching end of this June for 2.3. Okay. Uh, we'll see how it happened, but at least we'll uh, plan for that. Meanwhile, going a uh, preparation for ZFS 2.2.3. Uh, it's I, I haven't heard exact dates, but hopefully it should be soon. But primarily, it's bug fix release. Add also add supports for newer ZFS versions or newer Linux version versions, but also fixes all of known so far issues with block cloning. Uh, it still has block cloning disabled by by default, uh, but at least it should now work, unlike two 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 and earlier. Right. Uh, I don't have much other topics worked on other things. We found um, working on something cool. Uh, I'm out of ZFS things. The coolest I've done some review of a uh, dedupe, a new dedupe code uh, by Alan Jude's company. Nice. Uh, 
So it's looking like oh, it's, it, it seems to be already functionally complete. So I just uh, had some comments here and there, recommendations, and they are refactoring it in some point places just to consider that. And uh, plan is that uh, that that code should become public somewhere end of February for public review. So we'll also waiting for that. Nice. And is that pretty much based on the talk from the developer summit? Oh yeah, yeah. That it's Perfect. it's the nothing same. Different. It's it, no, no, nothing different. It's just that code was uh, gradually growing after that. Then waited for review for some time. Now, it, like I looked through, it it doesn't look bad. Uh, just okay. a few, a few comments here and there, and hopefully most, most of them are already addressed, but few are still are in progress. So hopefully we'll see in a month some public code for some public testers. There are some benchmarks are going uh, on. Uh, search. I expect to, there will be some public presentation of how cool it is, probably on top of what was already presented on the on Dev Summit. Very nice. I'm trying to see where my text vanished to. I think I lost what you said, unfortunately, but I'll I'll do it from memory. Hmm. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. End of June. Yep. Awesome. Um, any questions for Alexander as users to a developer? Well, keep up the good work. I'm excited about the dedupe thing. That sounds pretty cool. Alan's told me a little bit about it. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic about that. But mm -hmm. I, I, but what's the what's the general idea that that because you're limiting the scope of the deduplication, you can really get the benefit without without nearly as much of the cost as you do on a you know on a pull level. Is that the is that the correct way to view it? Um, Oh yeah, that's that, that's, it, it includes multiple uh, factors. How dedupe will be improved? Uh, it improves both on disk and in memory efficiency by just avoiding extra structures that weren't, weren't needed. And uh, most important, it changes from of uh, just simple hash based structure to combination of uh, hash plus log, where when you are writing data. Uh, Hash will not be updated each for each block each time, but the uh, will, will write a log sequentially, and then will flush it later in a in a bunch in a groups, so that it should dramatically reduce the dedu dedup table update traffic. That is currently one of the biggest problem. No, well, obviously, uh, not all, it does solve all the problem. You can dedupe like four eight kilobyte blocks. There are obviously some. Uh, limitation points of sanity. But uh, right now, if your blocks are small, it may happen that your dedupe table update traffic is comparable to your data traffic or even higher. Obviously, it's not acceptable. And the new design of a log-based dedupe should fix it, fix this approach. And it was presented on Dev Summit. Should be video somewhere on YouTube. Uh, that uh, it, it dramatically improves situation. Uh, Daniel, Thank have you, you used dedupe in production, or did you? Yes, read I the was a, and... absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think every, I think everybody here has probably had the same experience. You turn dedupe on, and then you cry for the next six or seven weeks, and then you throw it out and start another pool. Um, no, it can be even worse. <laughs> More so, okay. <laughs> you set it up, it works great for a few, a few weeks or more, even months, and then you've dug yourself a really deep hole. Yeah. Because but suddenly the, the DDRP table doesn't fit into memory and performance yep. falls off a cliff, and you have tens of or even hundreds of terabytes in the pool. And yeah. Unless you just double your ma uh, main memory, there isn't even a good way out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. No, obviously, uh, you still should consider where can you use it or not. As I've told, dedupe of like four or eight kilobyte blocks just will eat your memory no matter what. Uh, yeah. You should 
probably use it for bigger blocks. And uh, in combinations with uh, new improvement, it should become much better. But, um... plus, uh, yeah, plus, new patches include protection from our table getting too big. Dedupe will automatically start disabling itself, or you can uh, shrink the dedupe table, dropping all data from from it and uh, compacting I, structures. I have That's two questions nice. regaring that. Is, are there any uh, features planned to allow finer grain control over a block level deduplication via um, the copy file range system call by, for example, disabling it for certain data sets or setting a minimum block size to consider a block for a deduplication? And the other is, um, is anyone looking into uh, basically punching the uh, deduplication into duplicated files after the fact in an atomic way. So a system call basically that where you tell the kernel, I want you to rewrite this as deduplication of this data. Please do it in one transaction because you yeah. have some content dedup detection uh, it runs through offline. And then you need a way to basically replace this duplicated data I know that it will blow up snapshot sizes. There's no way around that without uh, block pointer rewriting. But if that's an acceptable trade-off, uh, it should be possible, shouldn't it? There were discussions of manual dedupe of what you're saying. Just uh, make this block identical to that block. Uh, no, like make sure they're identical, and the, then if they are identical, yeah, exactly. The important part is that it, the two things have to be atomic. Basically, here's the candidate atomically dedup uh, if it f is a duplicate. No, I'm not aware about any active work to implement it. There was some discussions about it, and uh, I I have feeling there was some sort of Linux syscall for that, even, but I don't think anything like that is implemented. Uh, if you don't need atomic, you can just already use block cloning. You may say, I know, I know. If you... Make this block copy of that block and it would work. With, with yeah, just without... uh, basically do an install of one file on top of the other and it will do hmm. what you're asking. Just because of how install. If you know that it, you want to replace the full file, yes, you can just do an uh, install dash uppercase S to make it a secure install and then it will basically create a DDAP file and atomically replace it for let's things like executables and shared libraries, that's good enough, but for potentially mutable data, that could still be a problem because, especially if you have to preserve hard links so that you really can't replace the file, but have to punch basically a deduplication into it. And yes, that's a hack, but it's the only safe way I can imagine it working. Anything else on deduplication, which I must say is a nice segue to block cloning. Has anyone sort of braved it and come up with a nifty new use case? Because I'm of the position, I'm sure we haven't even imagined the most useful use cases. Um, I've played around with deduplication in the past and found that for blocks above 128K, uh, if you have a good enough duplication, uh, deduplication, it can be worth it. Uh, you just have to price in memory just like Flash. Sure. And then what about block cloning? The most exciting uh, new feature ever? From all yeah. I've read and seen so far, I said, yes, the code is new, but it's Big improvements are that it requires vastly less memory mm. per deduplicated block, and uh, it doesn't uh, require this giant table always in the read path, even for uh, and write path for, for uh, non-deduplicated blocks. So mm -hmm. you only pay the cost for of accessing the deduplication data structure for deduplicated data where you probably are willing to pay it. And it's oh. a lot lower. But that's just uh, repeating the claims. Uh, 
I've yet to put it into production. Alexander, has your team exercised block cloning? Are we going to have a big old button enabling it on any of the products? Uh, no, uh, no, I personally run every all my system on uh, FreeBSD ma main, and uh, I have block cloning enabled. Nice. Nothing exploded so far. Nice. I can't okay. say that have. Uh, I can't say that I have some uh, very dramatic cases, uh, but just my routine work, development work, sure. laptops, laptops, all just work. Uh, closer to production, uh, in Zuna scale, uh, Dragonfish, which should be, uh, should be uh, RC soon. Uh, it's enabled by default. Oh, same, code, same code present in uh, in Kobia branch, which is now going to be uh, U two update two. Uh, it's present there, up to date, but it's disabled by default just for safety purposes. No, like, uh, it was first disabled, then it, it got fixed now, but we haven't re enabled there yet. But in next Dragonfish branch, it will be on by default. That's a plan. And uh, by the time uh, we'll... Uh, by, uh, in Q2, we plan to release uh, Turnas Core based on FreeBSD uh, 13.3, and by the time we'll likely enable cloning there too, because no reason not to at this point. It will get the same DFS version as scale at that point, so all the issues no one fix it, so it should be on. So it should be integrated with NFS, with SMB, with doing server-side copies within a share or between shares. It works pretty nice. Very nice. So my potential use case for block cloning would be that right now I basically have a snapshot and then I do a send and receive on the local system to get a deep copy of the template uh, or golden image of my jails and then instantiate them. So I duplicate the base system of my FreeBSD jails for every jail in my production system. And it would be nice to be able to turn that into a block reference deduplication because then I could retroactively do it. And when I do a rolling upgrade uh, to the next release or deploy patches, the big files in the jails would still be uh, deduplicated. So that you would keep the workflow of doing a complete copy, but you wouldn't pay the storage overhead without having to go to a full the immutable scheme where you just wipe it out and then do a new read-only clone or something, or do a new uh, yeah clone of a snapshot and then never change the clone so that you don't uh, have to rebase anything. And if block reference deduplication does everything the presentations promise, uh, then it should let us um, have our cake and eat it too. Nice. Oh, uh, Jan, is your next topic on the screen there a quick one? I know Rod had some feedback. It's performance related. Um, yeah, the, the question was if anyone looked into. So one of the problems where I found with just detracing the normal ZFS replications scripts uh, and tools is that oftentimes it's not that your pool can't feed, uh, read or write the data quick enough, but that it's just the ZFS send command send, put, uses lots of not too big writes, so let's say, yeah, four to 128K or so, writes that to a pipe, and then you run either DD with a large block size or something dedicated like buffer or M buffer from FreeBSD ports mm -hmm. to basically decouple the producer, the network, and the consumer on both sides of the network when you're doing network replication. And that's inefficient, ugly, uh, and then so oftentimes even the SSH, despite all the hardware encryption or high-performance networking patches, becomes a bottleneck. 
which is why I asked if anyone looked into just plugging KTLS in there so that we could have a TLS encrypt the TCP connection without any user space proxy processes, just a giant socket buffer between the send command. Okay. And then Rod mentioned that he has already prototyped this in 2018 for TCP without TLS. But uh, looking into the main pages, I can't find any reference to it. So I suspect it wasn't upstream. It, it has never been upstream. That's correct. There's some some mild security concerns around it because you're basically the ZFS receive is basically going to hang an open socket out there for somebody to connect to. And what up? Uh, would it be more acceptable if you used either a, a Unix socket to the kernel to pass a file descriptor or to uh, use well, an output to, to move but the you, file descriptor you, over instead of you having have the kernel listen itself? <laughs> you are, ahead, if you go look at the implementation, that's exactly what it does. It does pass a file descriptor into the kernel. And that's okay. what the send and the receive ends run on. The problem is, is if you create a socket, you, yes. you, you've opened it on the receive end, that socket is in listen mode. Yes, but there are secure ways to do it. You yes. could use. Yeah, I mean, simply doing it with KTLS. In, wait a second. It. Even in FreeBSD 13 and 14, you can use scoped IPsec policies to put a re required policy in both directions on the socket before passing it in. And then the kernel would ask via P uh, PF key for a session key and use IPsec and you couldn't bypass it. So you could have IPsec transport mode enforced right. on the file descriptor. Yes. It, but it, that's it, very FreeBSD specific and complicated to deploy. Yeah, this, Rod. Was, this was all being done to bypass all bandwidth bottlenecks, including encryption. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, anything that would slow down the data path was removed, which meant no one could. This is if you're shoving data sets around in your data center between trusted machines, you don't need any of those security models. And that's what well, based on it. John, don't interrupt me, please. Let me finish talking. Yeah, right. Sorry. The, the implementation is very trivial. It is very efficient. And the only thing that you need to tune sock buffer sizes for is if your BDP for some reason is beyond the the basic two megabyte buffers that FreeBSD allows the, the TCP socket to grow to. If you have a delay of greater than I think it's 12 milliseconds where that BDP starts falling off um, at gigabit, 12 milliseconds at a gigabit, or um, 1.2 milliseconds at 10 gigabit. You have to do some buffer tuning. But other than that, it basically will allow you to do ZFS send and receives at wire speed, theoretically clear into the 100 gigabits a second range. Basically, whatever your, your disk can deliver to, to the kernel. That's exactly the feature uh, I was looking for. And I re darkly remember that when someone worked on it, glad to hear that it succeeded at what you tried to. But um, yeah, my problem is that I trust my hosts. I do not complete, uh, unconditionally trust the network between them. So I need transport encryption. And if that's a scenario, I suspect that your um, delay of the BDP product is more than local switch networking. Yes, more like 20 milliseconds. Yeah, then you're in that scenario, you're definitely going to have to play with buffer sizes. Yes. And that was 20 millisecond and what kind of bandwidth? I can tell you what your buffers need to be. Depending on the setup, either one or ten gigabits. Um, so, so it's, it's just doing BDP based upon twenty milliseconds at ten gigabits, and and 
set your your shock buff stuff to that size. Yep. There's I think four cis cuddles you need to tweak. I know I played around with it and with lots of CPU cycles I could push through it to 10 gigs. Is that based on the recent call where Rod kindly gave his math for that, his formula? And, and I actually think there was a mistake in that math. I think there was a scale factor. Okay. Well, uh, this this is, seems to be napkin notes at this point, and anything more mature, more fancy than a napkin note would be greatly appreciated because it's a bit of a black art for many of us. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> If you if you Google BDP bandwidth delay product mm -hmm. and buffer requirements, you will find probably several papers written on the topic, and and you should also end up with if you add FreeBSD to that, you'll probably end up with some tuning pages that tell you what the four sys cuddles are that you need to tweak. And BDP was bandwidth delay product. Mm -hmm. You got it. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Basically, how many bits are in flight on the in the buffers along the network nodes you're hitting? Hmm. It it's how many bytes the network can hold in flight. Yeah. Whether you actually have them in flight or not. Okay. Depending on <laughs> if your buffers are big enough. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. So to finish is more precise. This thing is brutal. Cruel. It's brutal. Okay. Where are we? Oh, my, my. This... Just as a rule of thumb, I've found that it helps a lot to have about five seconds of your desired throughput as in-memory ring buffer on both sides of the network replication. But uh, the last time I tried that was in FreeBSD 12, so it could all be different now with OpenCFS 2. I found my spot. How many bytes your network can handle in flight? Uh, Rob, Rodney. do you want to give a precise definition? Oh, uh, Rodney, you had a pretty good one. What? The, uh, the definition, definition of BDP, how many bytes your network can handle in flight, was it? it, it well, it's, it's how many bytes, well, because it can be measured in any unit you want. Sure. It can be measured in bytes, bits, or kilobytes if you want, but sure. it's the it's the amount of information that your network can hold at any instant in time. In other words, these are, this is, um, I'm not doing very well with this. You're doing great. Yeah, for it's, those of us who are like struggling with it, you're doing great. Okay. You're trying, what, <laughs> let me flip it around. What the problem comes to be is if you have a, a, network that has a large delay to be able to utilize that network at capacity you have to put in flight whatever the bandwidth of the network connection is times the end-to-end -end delay that it takes for that data to traverse that network to be able to keep the network full any anytime you're not getting that number of bytes in flight, you're underutilizing the network. Now that ignores congestion in the and it's an assumption that your goal is to consume all of the bandwidth available to you. And my my description for that rod has always been it's the lobby. If you can fit it in the lobby, you should be able to get them through the doors. Okay. That just to yeah, yeah. dumb it down a few layers. The the so, doors are the net card, and the and the lobby is the is the send the buffer. Lobby. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that works. What? It, uh, yeah. So if you're basically if your TCP window is smaller, then a single connection will never have enough in-flight data, for example, more than two megabytes to even keep the link saturated. So if the network isn't otherwise hugely, uh, heavily loaded, you will never even get the chance to congest the network because the sender will just refuse to pu push more packets to the destination without getting the acknowledgements. So, Correct. Beautiful. 
a common example where you run into this is with SFTP, where for some reason the default window is like 32K times eight or something, because they will not have more than eight requests outstanding. It's not that the protocol can't do it, it's just that the normal client will never ask for more than eight outstanding read requests. So a smarter client could tune that, yeah. or you could this use is... multiple connections. Hmm. The bytes, the bytes in flight problem in the BDP is fundamental to all transport protocols, whether you be running them over quick UDP or TCP. You can't utilize the network to its capacity unless you can put BDP where the bytes in flight. And FreeBSD well, has pretty conservative defaults there. No, no, I wouldn't it say bumped up. We confirmed no, last I would, time. Right? I would say its defaults are very close to where they need to be. Um, I'm actually trying to convince the transport group that we probably need to bump up from two megabytes because at present you can't, you cannot saturate the typical home gigabit network connection over cable networks you can gpon you can saturate it but not the cable because the the cable has an inherent 12 12 to 16 millisecond additional delay in it i would like it to auto tune based on available memory and the fastest supported line rate of the fastest nick would that penalize the low well end? that doesn't that doesn't apply because you i mean the NIC, the NIC speed in your, if I have a local 100 gigabit NIC, you're not going to, you're not going to want to tune your buffer size to that 100 gigabit NIC because you're probably not trying to single stream out of it. The maximum, the one I can set with set sock up, I kind of want to go there. So that I don't have to yeah, manually have tune to, to do that through sys control. So, and that's, let it do its job. The kernel understands it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel if it's already there. Just figure out the right tuning settings for it. And those four settings that Rod mentioned, those are, I have different defaults if I'm running on 10 gig, 40 gig, or 100 gig networks. But it doesn't just depend, as Rod just explains, on your um, line speed uh, or path bandwidth, but also your path latency. So you have to that's size the, it to the product of the two. That's the starting point. Again, it's dynamic. So you need to be able to flex it saying, hey, if I'm running on a 100 gig network, but I'm only talking to 10 gig clients, I tune it down. Maybe the then the solution would be to have a more approachable SysCTL as proxy, which takes uh, basically latency and uh, and that's what Speed we and throughput uh, as input so that you don't uh, have we, to understand the math uh, and create how a, to size I, that. Great. Okay, go ahead, Stu. Create a script to do that. This isn't rocket science. It's no, it's not. Yeah. It's and Stu, you've done that. Here are your 40 options. I haven't done it to that. I've done it to the, I have my own defaults for my server deployments. Uh -huh. I mean, that in this environment with this number of, of clients. In this type of clients, but as a here's a script that will fix everything everywhere. No, but there is no universal 40 and 100 at this point running as ZFS SMB clients or NFS clients. It, and you're tuning data center or corporate environment, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. See, that's. Trying to tune this for the general internet is almost impossible. It just correct. Again, it goes to exactly you know where you're where you're sitting in your environment, how many hops you have, if it's a local network, if it's goes through three routers between your client and your server, changes all of that. And auto detecting that on the fly, while it would be sexy as hell, I there's definitely some machine learning in there to make that happen. And a lot um, of 
but that logic I think would belong to the kernel. So would it make sense to make this a property of routes? Yeah, but it's also it can also be defined by the switch. What I meant was, does it make sense to annotate routes just with, like with an MTU with a BPDU? Uh, so that we uh, could just have the right. my default route had this, my on-site route ha has this. Uh, you could instrument routes to have a, BD, uh, a BDP associated with them, but you you're uh, I guess when you open a socket, you could you, you look it up and decide your default max. Sock buff. Yeah, you, you could probably do something like that. And you can use and the, the route cache. I don't know if it still does or not, but we used to store, um, I'm sure we do, we, uh, previous RTT of a path. So it would be possible to do some, some more magic sock buff tuning. I don't, yeah, I need to think about that. That's a lot of food for thought, and that's very cool in service of all things the NFS send related. Anything else on that topic? Uh, I'm hurting on an Xfinity to Xfinity crosstown replication using the amazing Zelta. So, uh, yeah, please solve that problem and get back to all of us. Anywho, you if you're trying to transport GFS across Xfinity's network between two locations. Yes, sir. You need to tune some socket buffers. Let's have that conversation. Awesome. Um, Greg, you always have a question. You've been quiet. I don't want to leave any of your questions unanswered. And I know you were fighting some dragons a week or two ago, so maybe you've made progress. I actually have not made any progress on that. So. In, You're uh, quiet. Oh, welcome yeah, back. There, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no worries. Yeah. No, I have not uh, focused my attention there. We have, uh, they're putting a generator on top of our roof and uh, been pretty involved with talking with the uh, tradespeople, having meetings almost every day on that. So, um, yeah, I haven't been doing a lot of system and work in the last uh, couple of weeks, unfortunately. Um, it could be nice to take a break. I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Anywho. Uh, great. Thank you. Do we have any Thank topics you. that are not perhaps, say, Zelta related, which is a hot parallel topic, I must say. Um, other questions, random things, funny jokes. <laughs> so I could I, tell you a UDP joke, but you might not get it. But um bum. Rim <laughs> shot. <laughs> or shot rim, but um bum. <laughs> so uh that said, BDP. Uh, so I know uh, Daniel and Rodney, you've had a bit of a chat about this amazing thing. And Rodney, you said the nicest thing about it ever, which was, wow. And you're, if I can quote you in your career, you, uh, yeah, had not seen something that easy to use. Uh, had any, anything, uh, any feedback you need from the group or do you have ideas to share quests? Yeah. Breakthroughs. Um, what you got? So a you can share your screen if you things. want. <laughs> yeah, I might I might do that. So um so I think I think one thing from chatting with everybody about it for several several weeks is and talking to Jim about his thing is that I probably need some sort of like focus and sort of you know unique value proposition kind of thing. So so what I'm going to do with this and what I'm not going to do with this is probably not going to try to throw the kitchen sink at it and try to focus it as a very modular, very customizable for experts uh, tool that is easy out of the box for beginners and and really good for, you know, admins up to, you know, a couple hundred, a couple hundred boxes. Um so I think that I think with that focus in mind, I changed some, several of the defaults. So the defaults are now um, uh, a command called ZFS backup. Actually, I, I will share my screen just so that I can. Sweet, do it. Get through. 
Oh, through this stuff quickly, stop. and I'm gonna I'm um, gonna cheat by just showing my GitHub. Uh, uh, how do you do it? Your you can show your GitHub commits, right? I'm a little new to GitHub here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I've been a deadbeat uh, deadbeat uh, uh, open source user until age of uh, close to forty seven here. Um, should I be doing a Z, uh, get pull request? Should I be doing uh, you, you might get, if you're using dev, then probably not too much different, but, um, there's, there's a couple, there, there's a, there's a few additions that are, that are handy. I'm trying not to break anything, but you did mention that the defaults for the policy and the defaults for, um, uh, well, the defaults for the policy is the biggest problem is that. Uh, Zelta was originally, as I think I mentioned to everybody here, uh, designed to to help you migrate a system as fast as possible at 3 a.m. at night when something goes wrong. So you don't make a mistake. You don't, type, you know, it, it just helps you keep all that stuff on rails. Um, with that in mind, I wasn't doing snapshot history in the default policy. So so now the 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 you know, main function um, is definitely going to be, uh, you know, uh, oh, this is Omni OS bug I was going to ask about. Um, <sighs> it's it's just Zelta backup source target. And what that will do is it will optionally add a snapshot if it sees that the thing hasn't been written recently. Um, it will replicate everything it can. So if it's a new replica, it'll do the first snapshot followed by all of the additional snapshots, which is what CFS has to do there. Yeah. Um, and then do the same thing for all the children. So it'll walk through all the children to make sure you get absolutely everything. Um, and then finally, it's going to mount, it will mount it read only. So a couple of those defaults weren't, weren't the same before. Um, with that in mind, we're not going to do forced deletions at all. So one of the scariest things about a lot of about ZFS send dash capital R um, and ZFS receive dash F is it will delete the history to match the source no matter what, which is scary as hell. I mean, we do all this stuff to protect our backup servers and it's a it's a you know time bomb waiting to happen. Um, with that in mind, I'm also going to add some little tools like uh, um, like Zelta clone which will create a, you know, it just super easy. You could do it with XRs, but I think everybody would want something to take a tree of, of file systems and volumes, take the latest snapshot and then make a tree of clones that you can read right to. So in other words, boot a, boot a VM, boot a, boot a VM beehive VM as a second, as, as a separate VM in one second. Hmm. I mean, very, very nice stuff. Um, Lots of on-point documentation. So we don't do, if you do, um, yeah, Zelta, Zelta help and Zelta help policy. It'll give you some, some back and napkin tips on how to use everything. Zelta help sync. And it'll tell you here are the four, uh, the, the four uh, basic commands up here and then all the switches you could possibly ever desire. Um, and then a couple other, a couple of other like minor things to clean up. So, so besides, so besides easy to use and and backs up absolutely everything in the policy by, um, by default. I want portability, so I want this to work uh, just as well on Linux as OmniOS. I'm doing OmniOS testing for the last week or so, and it seems to be pretty good. I had to completely change the installer hmm. because the okay. install the install function in Illumos is. Uh, is is completely different than it is on BSD Linux and Mac. Oh, it works on works on Mac as well. Oh my God, I buried the lead. The um, initiator host uh, option. Now you can use capital uh, capital T to run the commands from this source host, or lowercase T to run the commands from the target host, so that you can orchestrate an external replication. Which means you could run Zelta on one machine, and then you know. Right now, it's, it needs it installed on the initiator, but soon I'm going to have it work so that 
you don't need any software except for SSH on the initiator. And you can you can centrally, you know, manage your entire replication strategy. Uh, Zelta has always supported full based backups. Um, in fact, that's my preferred model. And I think the documentation suggests that you absolutely should be using pull backups because you can create your your backup server as your most secure box that doesn't even have an SSH on it. Um, that's that's the way I do all of my backups have for uh, you know ever. So yeah, for sure. So you can do orchestrated backups, pull, push, um, anything you want. And and the reason for that, I mean, if I was making this a backup tool for enterprise, I would probably just make it do pull. But I do want it to be accessible both cross-platform and um, for for easy use. I'm also planning to make several mistakes that um, Jan has an intent uh, as an irrational feeling of needing to fix them, so he can help me. Uh, <laughs> help me make some improvements here so i'm gonna i'm gonna plant some plant some bugs like that um and then the final note is that this, yeah the final note is that this is going to be released under probably bsd2 clause on february 19th that's when i'm going to start really hunting for uh you know uh new new testers new new users and and hopefully contributions um so yeah february 19th will be when when the code gets starts to get a little bit slushy and you can expect the switches and um and certainly the main functionality not to change at all after that point um is that an anniversary a birthday or uh, what <laughs> it is a birthday but more importantly it is the monday after i get back uh from my vacation to costa rica which is wednesday so oh, right <laughs> then. okay so yeah, so that gives me two weeks to put some polish and doc on top. Um, yeah. The doc is a little uneven. I use the word volume when I should be using snapshot, blah, blah, blah. Um, right. But yeah, we, we're doing official official release that Monday. Um, uh, the good folks at Clara have uh, offered to take my money and help me get it packaged for uh, Debian, Ubuntu, and the BSDs. Um, so somebody else is, is going to have to help me with the limos. Um, but uh, yeah, oh, we'll get it. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Um, did you, when I heard orchestration, did you take into consideration that ridiculous idea to have one machine just tell a remote machine to replicate locally? Or one's kind of the controller and would be a local send that it's smart enough to say, hey, let's not send it over the wire to the controlling machine and send it back to the local machine where it's originating. Uh, yeah, so that's the initiator host. That's initiator, the, that's sweet. When I, said I was burying, when I said I was burying the lead, all you have to do is prefix the uh, to um, endpoint, uh, endpoint arguments with the initiator and it'll run the commands from there. Oh my, At the okay. moment, it does require Zelda to be installed However, uh -huh. I am 100% sure that's not necessary because, um, well, because there are enough quotes in the world. There, there's enough right. quotes, there's enough double quotes, enough backslashes. I can definitely, definitely make that work. Um, this should be modular enough. Now I did, I did make it so that you can do Zelda space a word and it'll run a script in the, um, in the share directory. So it is extensible and um, we should be able to pretty easily, uh, you know, the, most things are set up as environment variables and the environment file and policy files are pretty well documented. So it should be possible to replace SSH with, you know, with, with pipe doodads and, and stuff like that. There, there are a few things that I'm probably not going to, um, not going to develop too much. And that might be one of them because I do a lot of transfers over the internet. Um, but I think that most of those things should be po possible. And if we can get this, if we can get this polished, make it, you know, uh, make the sun folks happy, make the other BSD folks happy with it. Um, you know, I think it would be a good, you know, good, super lightweight, super portable toolkit for, you know, uh, helping, helping people, especially, uh, you know, new, new and new and intermediate people not make the kind of mistakes we we often make with our polls
And I haven't seen a new replication tool in what, five to 10 years. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jan, you had some questions about detecting stale backups and like, hey, we've not reached a threshold of, you know, we're out of date, oh no, look out. Or is that left to the operator? So there's a, uh, so capital lowercase, or sorry, uh, dash lowercase s will, will automatically snapshot if the written data uh, is incremented. So if the, if, if the thing is, if the thing is incremented, then it'll do it. And uh, minus SS will skip the replication entirely if uh, if no data is written. We are working on some um, pickling functions to uh, to keep track of of lists and also the the quality of backups and a prune um, and, and a prune command to to sort of start keeping in mind how much distance there is before the snapshots. One thing that I've noticed is when I've when I've looked at ours and other organizations snapshot snapshot trees is that they change <laughs> they change names. Somebody uses uh, ZFS snapshot periodic, and then they use ZFS snap, and then they have mm -hmm. stuff from Trunas. And so, what if there was a prune and a snapshot thing that didn't care about that because there's already crap loads of metadata that mm -hmm. tells you how old something is. I want a prune command that never ever deletes the first one. Like leave that to ZFS destroy. We never want to delete the oldest thing and 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 create a policy of pruning based on distance between them and also a pruner that is aware of zero size snapshots. Like clean those up. They just take long to, to list. We don't need them. Um so so like a smarter mm -hmm. pruner is something that I'd really love to add. Yes, Jan. Daniel, I have to disagree that uh, zero size snapshots add, adds nothing because they are the only way you can detect that a snap, a, basically a snapshot has been replicated and that your backup is in sync without having to look at the source. Mm. I I do agree, and but what about? But you're not going to look at at your hourly backups from six months ago. So mm, right, I'm talking yeah. about once you start getting to the hundred snapshots, there has to be some logic about which ones you're getting rid of and which ones you're not. Let me, let me um, interject a piece of right. on that. It is though a data set in itself might have a bunch of zero size snapshots, those snapshots often represent a total picture of a point in time and it's important that you be able to go, okay, I need a clone of that pool at this point in time. And if you don't have those zero size snapshots on those other data sets, that can be very difficult to create. So just to, know. just so that you know that your, your fleet is, has a snapshot from a specific point in time. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I'm just talking about um yeah, I mean I, I don't I don't think that I would ever make a well, first of all, the whole point of 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 Zelta is safety. So I'm definitely not going to make a like my my tool is definitely gonna be more cautious than anything else. I guess I'm more thinking about like clients that want 15 minute snapshots and hourly snapshots and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and then the, and then the recipe for that filtering, I mean, we could use like, we could use Perl or grep style, you know, regular expressions to say, you never do it if the data is, you know, divisible by X or, 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 or something like that. I just think that there's a recipe out there to make pruning a little bit safer than I've seen with other what? systems. One of the pieces of that recipe is, is that if all, I have this snapshot label, if all of the data sets with that label on them are zero size snapshots, in other words, across the whole pool, those are all zero size. Yeah, blow those away. Because that's, that's a point in time that didn't change. Ah, good point. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the first step actually is the pruner. The the pruner will 
you know, maybe maybe it's something that would be run every, you know, I don't know, maybe it's something that would even be run interactively and would give you, you know, would give you an idea. We are saving, you know, 347 snapshots, uh, you know, with, with these, with this date order and find some way to visualize that with a, you know, ASCII diagram or something. Hmm. And then you, and then you, and then you tag the ones you keep and then let the rest and then let the rest go. So I think there, I just think that there could be a, a way to provide some, some logic and tangibility to, to something that is often scary. Like, like I run ZFS snap destroy on my production pools constantly, which, which works for me. It's fine. But the backups I want to be a little more precious about. I don't want to, you know, I never want to run it. <laughs> so I need something that's a little smarter. It's not going to delete old ones. I don't know. There's, I think I should, I think I should make a, start making a proof of concept and we can yell about it. That would be amazing. Yeah. And all the known scenarios, because for every 10 scenarios you can list, someone will come up with five more. So just roll with it and I don't know, wiki or otherwise or throw them on the dock or something. But yeah, I, I've seen schools that needed air quotes, a hundred years of air quotes backups. And it's like, well, to some, that means like one ancient snapshot and one per year. Cause it's more archiving than snapshotting, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, just, just keep it coming. Um, I'm one other problem. So Daniel. I'm curious Daniel. about with, with, with this idea of making sure that everything with the same label is a zero snap zero size snapshot before deleting it. Is that a condition we're ever really expecting? I mean, I would not expect that to be a remotely common occurrence. Hmm. Well, I um, think a it's, common it's, occurrence would be like midnight, midnight first of month. And even if it's zero, I want it. So I think I think there's definitely stuff like that. For data sets, for example, for the company file shares, I expect that to happen for hours overnights, especially over weekends that you have hours where nothing happens on a weekday because the bad jobs run on weekends and on weekdays overnight. At some point, you expect things to be idle. But in other limitations, I would expect to run into uh, when pruning, like you're describing, is that several of the replication tools out there, if they recursively replicate a starting point, they expect snapshots to exist on all child data sets as well. So you can't just prune for the, the unmodified written equals zero uh, snapshots from the children because then the next replication will fail because it will decide on the parent which starting point to use for the replication of all the children. Well, some I tools do that. that. Zelta does yeah, it. Some... Zelta, Zelta will calculate the the written size uh, down the tree, and it it does it it create does actions based on that. So my pruning utility would do the same for sure. That's there, there's no that, that and also obviously that 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 would be necessary for cloning, as I think somebody mentioned before. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely on on board with that. There there would be no Swiss cheesing of snapshots. For the no way, because uh, yeah, you, because you said you wanted to basically augment existing tools with lacking pruning uh, helpers. You could right, but still, yeah, but still cross tree. I don't want to mess with that. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think we're in agreement there. Because. If the backup tool supports it, it would be nice to have the opportunity to punch yeah. this out of the subtrees which didn't modify. But it's a policy question which should be left to the operator and not uh, hard coded if you are willing to implement both by this time. <laughs> I like well, the, I mean, all I definitely... of this sounds like a policy decision Yeah, that should be left yeah. to the operator. Yeah, yeah. I think I think keeping keeping things modular and light and you know hackable and environment and policy, like I think that you know I think we can lower the bar or 
you know, my, my, my interest is lowering the bar in some of this stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I think every single person on this call is going to write their own. <laughs> So, but there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that need our help and hmm. uh and they uh you know they should hire us but they should also you know but they can also benefit from from this a little bit too so one horror story i can share from zfs destroy is i wrote a script which started out with destroy file system at snapshot and then i wanted to destroy uh bookmarks as well so i made the um type part of the snapshots so there was no longer an at literal so and then if you try pass the empty string as the type you wanted to destroy you got an empty destroy so you just recursively destroyed the, destroyed the data set if you use the wrong type on that script. Luckily, uh, it only wiped a lab system, but it recursively destroyed the data set instead of a snapshot. That would be really bad to happen on the wrong stuff. Yes. And the safety feature in BinSH of that is use an expansion with a question mark mm -hmm. so that this shell will rather explode than allow this variable to be empty. So in BinSH, you can safeguard against accidentally expanding into an empty string. But yeah, you're always smarter after the fact, right? Uh, Daniel, did I hear that one could use every snapshot tool in ports and then migrate to the promised land and it will just deal with the older ones based on a new policy and even new naming and just let them age out as appropriate? The idea, yeah, my thought is that I could create a a pruning. I mean, basically, it's a pruning relabeling tool that is extremely cautious, nice. but also realizes that if you have 700 snapshots in a day from four years ago, we're going to list those and say, you probably don't need those suckers. I think that such a tool could, could be a useful tool. Uh, you know, a useful module here. Now, for just hourly snapshots, hypothetically, are you doing anything about that at this point? You just say, hey, go set a cron job, do what you want to do, knock yourself out, and we'll handle the replication. So I, I set up Zelta to work with ZFS Snap's naming, script, naming scheme, and then I use the ZFS Snap Destroy uh, script to prune. Which works, which works great. Honestly, I gotta say, the only thing I don't like about ZF Snap or ZFS Snap, however you say it, is that it's ZFS Snap Destroy. So that is a perfect example of you're too tired to be doing this, <laughs> and uh, it could be really dangerous if you left off the NAP. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's ZFS Snap Destroy minus R. So it's three characters away from absolute catastrophe. And that's how you trim your old snapshots and make your stuff list faster. I, I uh, you know, I almost want to do a PR that says change that to prune. <laughs> ZF snap prune. And then maybe I wouldn't want to be writing my own. But uh, hmm. uh, yeah. but 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 I do, but I do see I do see value, especially for my old fleet, to have something that you know, renames for me and, you know, deals with the, the um, you know, deals with the naming and pruning schemes or, or as a prune assistant, let's say, maybe it's not yeah. going to do ZFS destroy at all. It's just going to help. Do... So, yeah, that would be an option of just basically li put, putting uh, out the list of data sets. And if invoked in a TTY or something, you also give out a summary of how much you would save. So only do the math and have the user pipe it in. You could yep. uh, do the same as a transport mechanism or a helper for concurrent replication and so on. If you have enough IOPS to make it worth it, then you could basically say, yeah, now these data sets need to be replicated. And then 
the data set has been replicated, you output it so that basically whenever a data set has finished replication, you would expect some kind of filter where you invoke a hook. It gets a standard input, the list of things to replicate, and then it writes what it has uh, replicated to standard out, and Zelda would be the wrapper around that so that you could yeah. put it. Some, uh, and then this replication script would be in charge of picking the concurrency regime. So it could be as simple as uh, xr-p8 some Zelda command which accepts the same format already or something. But you this, could also... Yeah, this is, yeah, this is so Unixy. y it, 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 this, is, this is the stuff. I mean, you know, you make this one thing that chains into the other. It's exactly correct. That is exactly the solution there should be. It's, the you get, problem you is get that you have to have a you, ring. It's not a you pipe. Have have what? Uh, you have to have basically... So you can't start replicating a data set before its uh, parent has been replicated completely. So for that to work, you kind of have to re uh, form a, a secular pipe. So Zelta has to use popen or something. So the whole helper script you're delegating the concurrency replication policy to would have to confirm that it has replicated the data set by outputting that again. So that Zelta knows that now anything depending on that can be started. Yeah, I mean, all that all that logic is awesome. already there. Is it, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, is Zmatch in sync with uh, the, 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 the sync and does its role change any now that you've kind of been sprouting features on the sync? Uh, could you say could you say that again? Well, I, so I am making a couple tweaks to Z, uh, to Zmatch. So I'm match, not sure if yeah. everyone's clear that Zmatch just tells you where you stand without doing a single thing, and I think that's just brilliant. I mean, that alone is worth its weight in gold, and it's like it's your problem. Yeah. So if you do, so. <laughs> if, if you do Z, yeah, if you do so, it's, if you do Zelta Match and then the name of the volume, it tells you how much is it, it tells you whether and how much is written to it. So whether, you know, so you can use that as a counter to see whether or not you need to snapshot and replicate it. And then if you do Zelta match, you know, uh, source endpoint, target endpoint, it'll tell you what needs to be uh, transferred, if there's any discrepancies before the children, uh, before the, uh, between the children, if they're the targets in front of the, the source for some reason. And, and, and also there's a pipe mode which is just tab out pipe um, that streams into the actual replication software. So, so Zelta is actually a a pack of pipes that uh, that that stream into each other. So it's it's uh, when I was talking about modularity that and Unix Unix uh, style lusciousness. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. The endpoint command is a is a pipe. You pipe endpoints into it, and it resolves them into, you know, post volume snapshot pairs or or sets. Um, the match is a stream of tabbed output that tells your command what to what to replicate in what order. Um, yeah, wow. yeah. So so a pruning tool that streams in exactly the same way and tells you, you know, maybe here are your here are your priority ones and uh here here at the and, and then you know you sort by importance or something like that that would be uh that would be one of many different options that we could do with the streamer okay and hooks like hey you send an email that i just succeeded uh, anything new yeah there? that's that's Wish that's for sure oh. yeah the, you know i i i do think that like you can you can modify the function like the snapshot name right from like if it's in, in cron, and then you might want to run it as different users. Like I have a user called space, which is my backup user. Um, and then I have a user called twin, which is my cluster user. Hmm. So that, that creates a hot, that creates the hot spare. And they both use different snapshot screen uh, schemes. One, the, the space user would use a snapshot uh, that, is, that is fixed to dates. So that's basically my RPO, right? 
my recovery point yep. objective yep. I snapshot every time is it they hits that and then the twin runs every x minutes and then i'll take another snapshot right before it sinks back because it wants a hot basically a, a semi a, a warm spare um that's ready to start so yeah so there's a lot that you know there's a lot from a unixy perspective where you know where depending on the environment it it might solve certain certain problems like you could stream the endpoints into something to for example do the wake on land process so use the use the policy script that would stream oh, wow. out the the hosts oh, yeah and then and then run a run a wake on land of course we can also add hooks to do that but that which would be trivial because the endpoint thing already explodes the thing whether you're doing the match or a replication or or anything else continuous async replication i mean that's sort of what i'm doing isn't it what I meant is, baby, whenever you're in sync, you check if create a snapshot and try again if there's any change, and then you That's wait for yeah, yeah. Zelta, so Zelta Zelta keeping a SS. Yeah, Zelta Sync SS. That's it. Oh, it, okay. yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because uh, I haven't found my, a good tool for that. If you look at my case studies, I, I show a, I show an example, though I think it's easier. It's even easier than it is described in my case studies right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, Zelda sync. Wow, that reminds yeah. me to look for my Google Doc of replication wish list features from like seven years ago. <laughs> As I'm looking at the ZX for mm -hmm. source code and ripping my hair out. So great work, poor man. thing. Great well, work, Daniel. The older tools with less. Uh, intelligent pruning logic often uh, created multiple snapshots when intervals occur the, at the same time. So you would basically create one every hour and one every day and at midnight you would create both. So that makes pruning easier because you don't have to consider multiple candidate intervals to match, but it's right. of course wasteful, but all the scripts yeah. do it. I I think set of snap is one of them. It it definitely does. I'm I'm always pruning uh, for every for for the first day of the month. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah. So that's another complication for pruning. Being if you want to basically support both types of. Uh, yeah, ZF snap looks identical history. to the yeah that my cron looks exactly the same basically with ZF snap. But, yeah. More modern tools like uh, ZWrapper, for example, still encode the, the timestamp into the name to get a unique name, but then do a kind of pruning logic similar to what RESTIC, which is instead of related, does, where it will try to match up the found snapshots against the, the, the copies to keep per interval so that you basically keep the news ones uh, in accordance with the policy. Right. I think I think Sanoi collapses, you know, snapshots mm -hmm. that would run multiple times, but that's basically he, he invented cron to do that. <laughs> um, well, which <laughs> no, the I problem mean, then is that if you collapse them and don't put the interval in the snapshot name, you need to do real date, date math and just can't keep the last n. Right. Yeah. Which isn't isn't a terrible idea. Or you can't just cover an interval. Or you can't just say, I want to keep this duration of snapshots of this label prefix or something, like other tools mm -hmm. do, because then you would never prune this range and you would keep all your 15 minute snapshots for your whole backup duration, which would blow up your disk probably. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it looks like you're willing to do the math, but the older scripts didn't. So they had to create one uh, snapshot per interval and timestamp. Well, I'm going for finesse if anything. Yeah. <laughs> all right fantastic all right well amazing, thanks everybody dude. so much for your dude. feedback this is yeah. amazing
So how did you uh, hook in the SSH replication right now? Oh, it's just a it's just a wrapper. So right. it would be possible so, to put something else in there that absolutely. gets you the stream to you in other Zelta or something. Yeah, there's everything is. If you look at the end uh, example, it'll tell you how to override everything. Um, so you can add a pipe in between. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. I did look, uh, but I didn't find an F uh, SSH. Uh, command line in the end file and on GitHub. Oh, the SSH command isn't in there? Okay, so I have some more documentation to do, but uh, the work of the documenter is never done, I don't think, but I'll- That's a thing of these calls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll, get that, I'll get that out there. But yeah, I would love to try a different, um, a, a different protocol at, at some point. Though that doesn't have to have to happen before February 19th. Um, no, no. I don't want to hold you up with such <laughs> details. But it would be no, really I mean, nice to be able to have basically an other transport, uh, which could be smarter, could use multiple streams maybe, because uh, how I solve the problem, what solved with uh, putting TCP into the kernel, I just solved it by uh, ignoring it and using multiple streams concurrently. Nice. Because I have enough uh, data sets I have to replicate, so I can just, and I have the IOPS uh, compared to the bandwidth, so I can just uh, overnight run like six or eight concurrent data set replication streams, each in their own SSH connection, and then SSH is no longer the front of the bottleneck. Right. So if you do, um, there's a threads option in the policy that allows you to fire and, and the the way it uh, the way it works is there's a there's a top level of the configuration called a um, uh, called a site, and then it will run X number of sites concurrently. So that represents for for my for my organization that represents each of my data centers and client sites. Hmm. So, uh, and it just it just uses XARGs, and also the list command runs in parallel as well. So if you have a, a source and target, one remote and one local. It'll it'll run those simultaneously, so it doesn't. So it's a little bit quicker than um, than some other options, but more parallel is better. I want all the parallel if we can if we can do it. Okay, so I dropped a link to Via Millipede, which tried to be parallel, and you said it was mighty fragile in practice. But hopefully, there's some lessons we can learn from it. Just yeah, saying. it's it's so, great. I mean, I I would absolutely hook into it. Um, hmm. I would I would make that. I would definitely make that and. Make that an option. I just I do want to focus on portability first before we add all of the visualizations. But for sure, absolutely, that's that's next and that's February work for sure. So nice. my my dream transport mechanism would look like something where when it isn't similar to SSH connection caching, just that uh, it. Uh, supports roaming the client so that you can back up your laptop with it and will reconnect and you need a server on every machine then right not really uh the server would just auto spawn is my idea so right. for push based based backups i would have a server and the clients could authenticate let's say ed2 for similar to uh, wireguard uh but the endpoint would look like a unique socket you can always connect to. And when the network is usable, the socket makes throughput. And otherwise, it just hangs and stalls, but doesn't fail. And it will forever try to reconnect whenever there's a chance so that you have a reliable stream which can survive all kinds of temporary network outages and yeah, roaming that's the, that's network the changes key. without uh, losing any state for the stream-based protocol on top of it, as long as neither endpoint reboots or crashes right. or whatever. That that's key because if you use Netcat, it'll fall over really easily. Yes. Um, yeah. So, what what kind of performance improvement would you imagine that to be over over SSH? Um, from none 
too quite noticeable. So uh, the problem with SSH as available in FreeBSD is that FreeBSD no longer includes the high performance networking patches because they are supposed to be no longer needed because OpenBSD's upstream SSH uh, has gotten better and ha hardware assisted encryption and decryption and slightly better ciphers um, made it a non-issue for gigabit ethernet hmm. for anything which is just a stream. So for example, piping uh, with a buffer on both ends, ZFS replication through SSH, one gigabit, not a problem. 10 gigabits, if you have fast CPUs with good offloading, it can work. Oftentimes it ends at six to eight gigabits for a single stream, even when you buffer uh, with something like a uh, at least first or second generation Epic or Skylake Xeon. But if you have a two fast desktop CPUs, you may push 10 gigs through with a single threaded connection. So, and beyond that, you need to use more than one SSH process because SSH just is, unless you patch it with quite invasive patches, is inherently single threaded and single stream. So yeah. Got it. But mm -hmm. what I would really love to see is something where it just, you use it as a Unix command, you basically tell it, I want you to put your cache to this maybe, or it could derive a default from the target. I would want you to try if there's a already established process which allows you to connect to this, otherwise replace the socket. So if it's the Unix socket is stale and then connect to uh, the destination through multiple paths, whatever, maybe make it configurable so that you could try it via multiple link local destination addresses so that you could even have it go over two paths. In FreeBSD, we, in theory, you, you could use SCTP. Um, on macOS, you have multi-path TCP, stuff like that or you could do it manually. But these kind, several people have tried to write this. It's not a new idea. Uh, the Pete is one. I've seen at least two or three others over the years. None of them are perfect. But for things like ZFS replication, especially before we had bookmarks to keep the state, it was so annoying when you had a, like 95% of your 10 terabytes initial snapshot has replicated if the connection fails. Reasonable sense. Right. Yes, we have that now. I know. I know. And <laughs> it's, it, time and for, it's time for East Coast. That was Coast not always today. an option. It absolutely was Ex not. Yes. In my bookmarks. day. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, OK. It's, and have bookmarks played into this in any way, shape, or form, just purely out of quick curiosity? Like, is that? Is that how resumable sense are implemented? No, it's not. I'm just curious, just shooting from the hip here. Like in like... several T tools. Keep I'm afraid I've got to get out work. of here, everybody. Okay, well, you are doing Rod's work. I mean God's work. I mean dog's work. I love it. <laughs> it's just I yeah, I've shared you with you that document of like all these wish list features. Hopefully you've knocked out most of them just organically. Yeah. Yeah, Great it's work. exciting stuff. And right. push rows, which are too hard, back. Don't try to be perfect for the first release. No, no, no. I, I, I want to just get it out there. So dock, dock and clean up. Yeah. I think is the is the next couple of weeks. But uh, definitely give me give me those issues, and I'll, uh, and I'll see if I can knock some out. Sure. But when do you just people are excited about the, we are, this group is, but I mean, we should do like a usability naming, maybe group sessions, like, hey, what's a clever, you know, if you've got questions, like, should I name it this or that? I'm sure the group would love to help. All right. Sounds uh, great. Like you said, and you made a great point on, you know, this command is three characters away from data set destruction. Like, yeah, let's <laughs> not allow that. And it yeah. takes a second or third set of eyes. 
Greg, I worked with the guy who wrote this, uh, UDT, and you are totally, totally welcome to drop in the doc because, hey, I trust you and this is your call, not mine. So let's see what you got. Uh, open source equivalent to Espera. Could you tell us about that? Drop it in the doc, drop in the doc. I'm about to do the same. Here it goes, boom. Oh, not that one. It Zoom failed on copy. Uh, Greg, what you got? Yeah, uh, yep. there. Yep, you can hear me. Good. I can hear um, you. Yeah. Hopefully um, you, you guys were talking about transferring uh, snapshots and whatnot around. Um, when I worked for the government, um, we were one of the first people in Canada to have a 10 gigabit internet connection. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with who Aspera is, but they um, they do a scale and window kind of thing so they can maximize the bandwidth. They don't rely on TCP. Nagular algorithm they they do through UDP and take care of uh, the window size of themselves. Anyway, uh, basically you can saturate any link that uh, you have, and um, you know this is 15 years ago or so. Um, their licensing was extremely expensive. So uh, a guy who became a friend of mine who was working at the University of Chicago. Um, asked Espera for a quote and they were going to charge them something like 70000 a month um, just to transfer data around. Uh, so he wrote a thesis on on how to do that uh, free, which was the, uh, the UDT um, product. And it, it uh, I used it several times and I still use it to this day if I'm doing uh, my own internal transfers. It's not something for the non-tech people uh, to use, but anyway, uh, the story is that it it, it will saturate basically okay. any network link that that you uh, use its library to wrap it in. You can wrap our sync with it or or whatever um, you wish. And uh, as you know, our sync is a single uh, threaded application, just kind of like FTP or whatever. Um, but if you wrap it with this UDT library, um, it'll send off lots of threads and saturate it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Love it. Love How it. does it deal with the congestion events that occur when attempting to do that? Um, so I, I, I get, I, I'm not a developer, and if you looked at the source code, you'd probably be become very clear to you quickly. But my understanding is that with the Nagley algorithm and standard TCP, uh, when it hits some congestion, it, it, it times down quite a bit, and then it does this uh, step ladder kind of thing back up unless it hits another bump or delay or whatever, and it'll go down and start over again. So yeah. um, this this one's a lot more aggressive. Like it doesn't do the step up. It will, as soon as it hits a problem, it'll just wait a little bit and then try to maximum size window again that it can push. So it's it's just aggressive with the window sizing is my understanding. But it, it's definitely worth a look. Um, we had a studio in uh, Korea and uh, we were using SCP to transfer over there. And of course, that's horrible for transferring data. Hmm. Um, and uh, we were getting like maybe 20 megabits over our gigabit uh, path that we had to there. And I implemented this and um, the studio told me to back it off because it was killing all the other connectivity. It would just use the entire gigabit. Yeah. And, and Korea is a long haul away with many hops in between us. Um, so uh, I was pretty impressed that it could saturate a gigabit connection across the pond. But Nagel's algorithm is normally something different and not your enemy in this case of ZFS replication. Nagel's algorithm is mostly a problem for interactive usage where you have enough data that you at the application logic, something like an RPC protocol, like NFS would run uh, into Nagel's algorithm. You do an LS, you have a request you want to send, but it decides not to send it because, well, it may fit more into the buffer and then into the packet. And that's where Nagel's algorithm becomes a problem. When you just fill up every buffer within microseconds, that's not a problem. At least it yeah. shouldn't be. I, I took a very quick look at this UDT, and the problem with doing something like that is it's what's called TCP unfriendly. Oh, and yes. Basically, you will drive everybody else off the network. 
<laughs> this type of code should never be run on the open network. Well, you want to do it in your yeah. data center? Go ahead, but don't run exactly. it across the internet. If you teach, if you let him finish, it's dangerous. Fair That's enough. Completely right. Yep. <laughs> It works really well. <laughs> it works too no, no, well. No, it doesn't work very well because it's what it does is it basically stomps on everybody else trying to use the path. And that doesn't work in networks. Well, it, it works in our networks. We're, we're not traversing the internet. We have dedicated circuits. We make uh, deals with telcos and whatnot. So um, we've paid for that bandwidth up front, right? I, I get what you're saying, but... Um, Run run two instances of it at the same time across your network, and you'll find that they pretty much trash each other. Oh, I'm sure they will. Like, um, so so for our use case, maybe it made more sense than, than normal use cases. Um, we have hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data to transfer. We're, we're in the media industry, so when we partner with other studios, we're just transferring that once to one one studio just to keep things in sync. Um, it's not something that's running all day or whatever, right? It runs for a couple hours and then we're done. <clears throat> but uh, but I agree. I mean, you got to be a good network citizen. Um, and and uh, to that end, there are arguments you can pass to it. So you can specify the amount of bandwidth that you want to use. So even if you're on a gigabit, you can say use 100 megabits maximum and, and it will stick with that. Anything else? The other guy okay. who tries to use rsync while you use UDT for his uh, replication job. Sorry, was that a question? No, huh. just a slightly barbed comment. Yeah, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that, uh, you will basically evict for everyone else from the network and we live the congestion collapse for everyone but you. Yeah. yeah. No, he, uh, I get what you're saying. Um, you, you know, you got to be responsible when you're using it, right? It's like, I guess you could say it's a loaded gun. It's up to you if you're going to spray uh, the crowd or not. Um, but uh, uh, with for for our sync, uh, totally unrelated. Um, for our sync, I use a command called parallel, um, which will spawn off a bunch of instances of our sync, and that too will pretty much saturate any line that you're on if you're not careful. Around six streams, I found is the sweet spot for doing that. But it, at least it still uses TCP, so you achieve uh, fairness among all TCP streams. Fair enough. The, yeah. the problem with and writing your own UDP based extra fast transport protocols is that unless you are really careful, you will by default just use up every bit of bandwidth and the existing fair network transport protocols will see that as congestion and will throttle themselves to death so mm -hmm. that you get ever more. So you basically consume it all until uh, the network is effectively unusable for anything but transports using your protocol. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Anything else? The, I am good. Go ahead, Rodney. The need for six parallel R syncs can usually be tracked down to an inadequate socket buffer size. Basically, is what you're doing is you're you're compensating for the fact that the socket buffer isn't big enough to cause enough in-flight data by multiplying the number of people having that much data in flight. Okay. Um, this is a it's a common you can you can examine it pretty easily with iperf and look at the single stream iperf mm -hmm. performance versus six streams of iperf performance and you'll see that the six streams are basically getting the same thing that the one stream was able to do and the reason for that is if you watch the congestion window size is the congestion window never opened up enough to get enough data in flight all right that sounds interesting and i'm going to play around with it so your your suggestion is if we adjust our buffers correctly um with one instance of our sync we'll see the same as six paralleled yes okay once you started the bug transfers 
This mm -hmm. does not apply to the CPU bound parts of Async. For example, when you're checking uh, the rolling hash function or uh, for the scanning of the directory tree. So if you have lots of files, there's still, and you have enough CPU cores and IOPS, it can still be worth it to break up the jobs into multiple Async transfers. Interesting. Because, but once you stream, modifications uh, because async and if a file already partially exists for example it will have to run a rolling checksum over both and then checksum each detected block and then transfer only the changes which is normally really worth it over the network because that's still a lot faster than transferring everything that's how async works so well over unreliable links but Interesting. So, so you're suggesting that we could make FTP transfer as fast as AirSync or as fast as the network will allow? FTP is a completely different protocol. Yep. No, it is. FTP but it's over is a TCP. horrible protocol. Yeah, it's a. It's the it only sucks, one but... <laughs> which can really argue that they didn't know better at the time because right. it's older than TCP. Mm -hmm. It has two port numbers because it started over NCP. Yeah, it was a pain but in the arse to configure firewalls with. <laughs> depends on active versus passive, but yes. The real yeah. problem with FTP is that FTP um, can't preserve any metadata and uses far too many connections. Yep. So you have lots of uh, connection which each individually ramp up and down. So Save that for the lobby bar. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm okay, gonna gang, I'm going to call second. it. Uh, <laughs> have a fantastic week. Great work, everyone. Uh, I think the administrators of the world need a lot more education on these, uh, yeah, these topics on you know, the, the buffer length, etc. Catch you uh, perhaps tomorrow for B. Michael, Always a pleasure. Bye. Yeah. All right. Goodbye, guys. Baby.